Hello and welcome to Read Brave, a comics podcast from the Graphomania Podcast Network. I am Vinton Bain. I'm Corey Casto. I'm Scout Casto. I don't know if I can do this through my tears. <laughs> we just watched Logan, like just watch, like 15 minutes 15 ago. 15 minutes ago, yeah, 15 minutes ago. So yeah, we are coming at you with a, not a bonus episode, because this is a full bona fide episode, but we're coming back a week later rather than two weeks later because we have a special interview as a segment this time around with Kelly Thompson, the author of Hawkeye, the ongoing series for Marvel. It was so exciting to be able to interview her. Yeah, it was brilliant. I managed to keep my fangirling at a minimum, I think, I hope, unless, I pray. you know, she listens to this and is like, um, she failed miserably, <laughs> <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> That's all that matters. It's all anyone can ask. <laughs> so, Scout, what did you read this week? Um, well, I didn't read a whole lot because, see, usually I binge read a couple days before we record. And this week, um, I didn't have as much time to prepare. And, I'm, yeah. you know, I got kids, man. So, um, <laughs> but, okay. So, I read issue three of Hulk. Um, it has, I think it's my, I mean, I think it's my favorite issue so far. Yeah, um, I agree. I think that she is keeping, she's writing this as kind of like a slow burn. It's like each issue is really interesting, but the tension is building more and more yeah. with each issue. Yeah. My note on this was this comic is going slow, but in the best way possible. Yeah, exactly. They're really taking the time to dig into the characters. And I really appreciate that. They're not rushing into action because that's what you expect from a Hulk book. Right. It's just action, action, smashing, smashing. Right. Exactly. Um, I read issue two of Curse Words, which I was really excited yeah. about. Um, yeah, more of the same awesomeness. Yep. I have really high hopes for for it. Yeah. 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 Um, and then issue two of The Few. Um, I didn't get to that one. Okay. Well, I think I've decided that this might be my favorite new current image really? title nice. I, yeah well Man, i don't I know like <laughs> maybe i maybe maybe i just require less substance because there, there isn't that <laughs> i mean the i think that this is one of those comics where the art tells a lot of the story even though the art is minimal it's um yeah i mean there's not as much dialogue happening but the art does a really good job of moving the story along are there separate is there a separate uh, writer and illustrator, or is it the same person? No, it's two different people. Uh, Sean Lewis writes, and Hayden Sherman is illustrating. That's interesting. I wonder how much like they're involved in each other's role in it. It you has know? to be quite a bit, I would uh, guess. I would think yeah, so. Yeah, because of the way it flows. Sometimes you can just tell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, then issue four of Slam, which, again, I didn't read much, but everything I read the last couple of days I really, really liked. And this Yeah, I didn't get to that one either. Is it good? It's good. Nice. It's my favorite issue that's happened so far. It's on my to read list. Yeah. It's my favorite issue that's happened so far. And I know that I'm forever praising what Boom Comics is doing, but they're this is such a wonderful comic about friendship and um sticking together, especially for young girls. It's I really, really like it yeah. a lot, and I hope that more people go out and find it, because I, I don't feel like many people are talking about it, mm. and it's really great. Yeah. Um, I recommended it to my friends who are in roller derby yeah. and, and sent them links where they could get it. <laughs> and this issue was really fun, because I don't actually know that much about roller derby, and it actually spends the first couple pages explained to you the rules of roller derby, That's which I awesome. thought was yeah. really awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, for some girl, young girls who might read it and go, this seems kind of awesome. I want to might want to try this. You know, it could be a way for them to find out, find a new passion yeah. to try out. Um, I read Jim Henson's The Power of the Dark Crystal number Ooh. one. Was it good? It was good. good. Um, I like many kids. You know, like since we're still kids, guys, many kids yeah. our age um, <laughs> grew up watching the movie. And I mean, it was um, my sister was super into fantasy. And so I grew up with the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, like on repeat in our house all the time. <laughs> so it was nice for nostalgia's sake. Um, the art is just gorgeous yeah. in it. Yeah. And so it's telling the story. You know, it takes place, um, I believe, like a hundred years after 
Yeah, the, I think that's what the I movie heard. is. So um, a lot of fun, and it's going to be a short series. I think it's just one of that was issue one of I don't remember how many, but maybe four or something like that. So um, if anyone's in, loved the movie growing up, it's uh, a lot of fun to read and won't take up too much of your time. So um, and I read Brave Chef Brianna, which is another mm. issue one of four that Corey had me read, and he might have some to talk about. Yeah, later. I was going to talk about it. Yeah. Go for it. Well, okay. So I read Brave Chef Brianna. I think it's a Boom Studios yeah. title. It is, yes. Um, it's basically about this girl who her dad is like a famous chef, and he's about to die, and he tells his children, I'm going to leave one of you my throne, I guess. You know, empire. Like my empire, yes. Yeah. And, and whoever is the most successful chef, who uh, you, all of you open a restaurant, whoever is the most successful will get everything. Don't do this, parents. That's a horrible way to pit your children against each other. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of reminded me, that uh, moment reminded me of uh, Stardust, oh, where yeah. all the like princes are yeah. trying to kill each yeah. other. Uh, so anyway, like no one has any faith in Brianna, and so she opens a restaurant in a place called Monster City, and unbeknownst to her and obvious to everyone else, including the reader, a place called Monster City is probably going to be inhabited by... Monsters. Monsters, yeah. <laughs> monsters. <laughs> Go so, figure. And monsters aren't allowed to eat human food, and that's all she knows how to make, and so, you know, crazy <laughs> hijinks ensues. But I thought it was a fun comic, um... And I like the artwork. The artwork matched the story very well. Um, she's a plus-sized young woman, and it was never mentioned, so I like that in the like vein of faith. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the very end, there is a recipe. The title of the uh, issue is also the title of the recipe that they give you at the end of the, the issue. So yes. I thought that was a nice little add add-on. Yeah. And the recipe in this issue sounds delicious. It does sound delicious. And I want to try it. <laughs> mm. So I'll definitely be uh, keeping up with that. Uh, I also read Extremity Number 1, which is a new title from Image. I picked that one up today. I haven't read it yet, though. I really liked it. Um, I like when, like, for instance, Star Wars, I think, I feel like Star Wars is a fantasy that's set in a science fiction world. You know, like, when mm -hmm. I think about science fiction, I think of it as being in a human world that's like far in the future. Yeah. But this is like Star Wars in that it's set in some kind of uh, what you feel like is a futuristic society. But when you read it, they might as well be like, you know, wearing chain mail and having swords and stuff. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I really enjoyed it. It was really good. Um, I'm looking forward to reading more of it. Uh, I also read number one of Animal Noir. Uh, which is an IDW title, and I wasn't really a fan of it. Um, I didn't care for the artwork. The story was pretty good, but um, the artwork just distracted me too much. And for what they're going for, like if you like that kind of story, I would recommend checking out Black Sad, which is a Spanish comic uh, that several issues have been translated to English, and it's like the... French comics that are like a uh, small picture book size. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I think there are four or five of those that have been translated into English. And I've loved every one of those. I thought that they, they were all amazing. Um, so disappointed that Animal Noir was not, for me, was not better than what I was hoping for. But it made me want to go back and reread Black Sad. Benton, what have you read this week? So I made a mistake. <laughs> and knowing it would be bad because never is a comic book adaptation or prelude or anything like this of an upcoming comic book movie good. I've never seen one. I mean, prove me wrong. S send me a yeah. tweet or an email. Let me know if you have a great one. Uh, but I couldn't help myself when I saw that <laughs> Spider-Man Homecoming had a prelude comic. And so I, I checked it out and... You get about two pages of original content that explains that video that Tony Stark had 
in the Captain America Civil War movie yeah. of him stopping the car, Spider-Man stopping the car from hitting the bus. And then it goes on from there to just recreate scenes from Civil War panel for panel. Oh, my god! Exactly. Gosh. Dialogue for dialogue. Nothing extra whatsoever. <laughs> and ends saying, next, Civil War, where they're about to fight. And so I'm assuming the next comic is just going to be the rest of the movie in comic oh, book form. Yeah. And it's not even like a good telling you. It's just like, hey, if you haven't watched the movie, you should read this. Everyone's watched the movie if they're interested in this. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's so silly. Why Why do this? Why? That's all the time we're going to spend on that. <laughs> I did read a lot of different um, of my Marvel stuff that I keep up with. I read Amazing Spider-Man, the next issue that came out. And this is finishing the clone conspiracy tie-in parts of the main title. And just really, really predictable. Super predictable. Um, without spoiling anything, I just wish that sometimes comics would let people stay dead and not do this thing. It just gets old. And it's just the same thing over and over and over and over. <laughs> yeah, you got to move things along, you know, introduce new people or bring new people in or. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just repeating the same story. Yeah. yeah. That being said, they released the Clone Conspiracy Omega issue, which there's like, hey, let's just keep pushing <laughs> this event. And I guess there are things that need to be tied up that they brought up, but really just tie them up in the event and end it. There's no need for this. Hey, we have another number one, guys. No, unnecessary. But this had a couple of different stories tying up different loose ends. And the first one was actually really good. If it was just the first story with Rhino, I would have given it five stars. It was wonderful. It was about Rhino losing his wife again and how he dealt with that and Spider-Man calming him down and talking about how you move on after losing somebody. And it was really just beautiful. Um, the rest of the stories I didn't really care for, and I can't say it loud enough. I do not care about Ben Riley anymore. It's not the nineties. He died. Let it go. <laughs> Don't make him a super villain, especially. I also read Spider Gwen, continuing the Spider Gwen Miles Morales team up. It was pretty good. I I do like the team up. I really liked that they brought Kamala Khan in and they addressed that Miles hasn't been with the champions, and she was there asking where he's been and what's going on. But the story's starting to make my head spin a bit with the dimension hopping, and it's not really getting anywhere anytime quick, going between two different titles, and we've had this many issues, and almost nothing has happened. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on there, but I do wish they would draw this some conclusions. I read the Great Lakes Avengers, the new issue of that, and it was pretty fantastic. I really like uh, Bertha, and this was pretty centric to her. It had her going on to a job where they, she was doing a photo shoot and she comes to find out they only want her there so she can be the before and after picture for oh a weight loss gosh. thing. Wow. <laughs> and they need to do it quick. And of course, she's angry about that. And of course, nothing is ever what it seems. So yeah. things happen and it's pretty fun. Continues to be a really fun and funny book. And I appreciate that. Another bit of a disappointment I had this past week, hey, I can say week finally and not get it yeah. wrong, it makes sense this time, <laughs> is that I read Champions, the 1.MU, the Monsters Unleashed. Yeah, I forgot Unleashed I read issue. that one too. Yeah. Not great. I didn't like it either. It, um, the the yeah. super group, the super villain for hire group of teenagers that they introduced here, super annoying. Yeah. Did not care for them. And the Champions themselves felt like they were poorly written they were like a parody yeah. of themselves tripping over their own feet left and right like they have never been on the avengers yeah these are superheroes they know what they're doing they might they're kids but they're not fumbling idiots come on yeah <laughs> and i just didn't appreciate the way it was written and that i'm being too negative for the show probably well but <laughs> here's here's um i wanted to stop you for a moment because i feel like we've all read um not the complete run of monsters unleashed but we've read we've each read a couple issues yeah. and we were not we were underwhelmed i guess mm -hmm. and i was really looking forward to it because who doesn't love monsters you know yeah. and combining monsters with the marvel universe was really exciting and so then this week i saw that there's going to be a monsters unleashed title that's ongoing. like a monsters team yeah, yeah an ongoing <laughs> and so the feeling i felt was like in the movie a christmas story <laughs> when Ralphie gets the decoder ring and like yes. it says drink this is more such Ovaltine, a analogy. I was like, "Are you kidding me? This whole thing has been a commercial." 
a like, commercial for so a new accurate. comic book. And like the the cover of the comic book is it's like four monsters giving accurate. a thumbs up on there. Like some kind of, I don't know, ridiculous, uh, I don't know, something ridiculous. <laughs> garbage comic. Yeah, <laughs> garbage comic. It, it was like, like when they um, put in a comic for uh, like... Frosted Flakes or something, yeah. and the like. <laughs> Captain America's on the front, like giving a thumbs up and eating a bowl of cereal. I just felt so betrayed by Marvel. Yo, dog, I heard you like gimmicks, so I put some gimmicks on your gimmicks. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm pretty, except for Man Thing, written by R.L. Stein. I'm done with you, Monsters Unleashed, and all you monsters. You can be released. I am as as pretty I'm excited about Man Thing by R.L. Stein, though. Yeah, <laughs> let's be honest. And I haven't read the new issue of Monsters Unleashed, and I did kind of like the last one, but definitely this is the only tie-in I read. And if they're all like this, uh, but just, it, my, here's my biggest disappointment about it is that this team that was introduced, I was like, okay, this is just for. Monsters Unleashed, this weird super teenage group that just happens to be here and be more trained than the Avengers somehow, even though they are super young and villains that have no training whatsoever. But they're they're going to be gone because this is just, you know, a point whatever. It has nothing to do with the original, the regular series. But then the regular series comes out and it's kind of a prequel to this, introducing them into the main series and how they're going to be the big bads for a while, yeah. apparently. And half, listen, half, I love Champions. I'm going to keep reading it. Half of the new issue of Champions is just this super villain teenagers tormenting two homeless people. Yeah. For half an issue. Yeah. Unnecessary. I understand they're super villains. I don't want to read that much about their tormenting acts and how much they think it's funny. I don't care. <laughs> just tell me they tormented some homeless people and I'll know they hate them. Yeah. And I I don't know. I mean, I know that comics are have always been a political commentary, which I can get behind. You know, I know that that's a thing and it always has been. But I feel like every issue of Champions is a political commentary. Yeah. And while I do love all the characters in it, I just it's getting to be a bit tedious. You know, I, yeah, that's yeah. yeah. But I will say the new issue of Champions, the first half of it where they're just playing around playing paintball and training mm -hmm. was fantastic. I love that part. More of that, please. Less yeah. of the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> I also read Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur issue 16. And the timeline's starting to make a little bit more sense. I think this is taking place in the upcoming Halloween, which is why it's set during Halloween, not the previous one or not some one in the far off universe that doesn't make sense because, guys, it's February. Yeah. It was think... February when this came out. Don't make a Halloween comic in February. It's confusing. Yeah. Someone needs to show Marvel a calendar yeah. or a timeline. Yeah. <laughs> but they, at the, again, not to bring spoilers in, but they do bring in the X-Men at the very last page and they say something that make, makes me think this is coming right after the events of uh, Inhumans versus X-Men or somewhere after a bunch of things that happened there. So maybe this is a bit of a future jump. One of those things where everything's going to catch up with this comic. It gets confusing. Comics, guys. I do like that Doctor Strange was in here, but it was not a seamless transition from the last issue to this issue. The last issue, she shows up on his doorstep, and this issue, she wakes up in one of his rooms, and he's, like, casting spells on her, and, she, and he's just like, hey, everything's going to be okay, on your way now. And it's like, wait, what, what just happened? They didn't even talk. What's going on? <laughs> so, I don't know what was going on there. Maybe they did some kind of digital mini special that I missed that explained all of that. I finished off the new volume of... All New Wolverine, the new issue that came out, finishes this story arc. And it was one of the best issues yet. I love the way it all played out. There was a lot of very interesting Pinocchio references. Uh, there was a bit of a redemption story, and it had all those feels. Yeah. <laughs> so I really liked that. And, guys, I, just watching Logan, I, Laura Kinney, she's so great. Yeah. X-23. Yeah. I also read Unstoppable Wasp, and another fantastic issue here. I loved LaShayla, this new character that we got introduced to, and I'm so glad it looks like we're going to be seeing more of her. I also really liked Amber in the in the issue. There's a punk art girl that she came into contact with. Uh, doesn't look like we're probably going to see her again, but I hope she does come back. So I, I like that uh, they're introducing a bunch of different characters in there, and she's building a bit of a super scientist girl group there. And I hope they finish the introductions and get to doing what they're going to be doing there uh, too many more issues of this is going to get a little tedious, but I do like all the new characters coming in and hope they do something really cool with them because it has a lot of potential. Yeah, I'm excited to read this new issue. I haven't gotten to it yet, but it's it's been so much fun to read. 
And then I read Hawkeye number four with the person that we're interviewing a little bit later. And I loved it. Either you guys get the chance to read I Hawkeye 4. I haven't gotten to okay. it yet. Yeah. I, I All I have to say is that Kelly Thompson is delightful. The series is delightful. The art and the writing are great. And I'm just so satisfied with this comic. Uh, there's a quote in it that I, <laughs> that I loved. It's not going to make sense until you read it, but it's Julie Andrews saves the day. Sweet assist from Hawkeye. Best team up ever. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. <laughs> so I'm super excited for where this is going. It did kind of tie up some of the story and kind of looked like it was leading into something else, but it's not the end of the story arc. So I'm interested to see where the next couple of issues go. Aside from Marvel, I tried out a new comic, a number one called Sun Bakery, and this is a image title where it's going to be a bit of an anthology, but it's all done by the same artist and author, and he's doing multiple different stories, combining some of the uh, more Asian manga influence here uh, from the old Shonen Jump comics, getting some influence from there, and I, I liked it. Uh I don't know if I'll keep going with it. It's not really my style too much, but it was fun and really well done. I liked a couple of the stories a whole lot for sure. I also read the second issue of Curse Words, like we already talked about. It's great. Still going strong. And finally, I read Royal City, Jeff Lemire's new series. It's going to be an ongoing and he's the artist and the writer for it. And guys, it's so good. I love Jeff Lemire and this is him and his element. This is him at his best. So I had read something and it was like uh, something to that effect that um, like it was a return to what made Essex County so good. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So uh, it's in the back. He has a long essay about just why he's doing this, this series and why he loves this type of series over genre stuff and the other type of stuff that he does and why he didn't just continue Essex County and instead did something like this. And it's just really cool to hear all those reasons from him. And one of the things he said in there is he's worried because things like this aren't quite as popular as, of course, his sci-fi stuff or his horror yeah. stuff or his Marvel stuff, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you. I know we're not at recommendations yet. All of you that are listening, please just go put this on your subscribe list because this is something that should continue happening. And he, you can't continue a comic unless people are subscribed to it. That's just how it works. You can't wait for it in trade because that's not helping anybody. The comics numbers are built off of how many issues a comic shop orders and they order issues based off of how many people are subscribing to those comics at the shop. So go to your local shop, please subscribe to Royal city. Also, there's a playlist in the back. He's going to make a playlist for each issue. And he has a Spotify account where you can go and follow the playlist. That's awesome. I didn't notice until I got to the last page. I wish he would have put a little note in the front. Yeah. I would listen to it while I was reading, <laughs> but yeah, that's a really cool addition for me. So I love that. Were there any tracks that stood out to you? Well, since I didn't uh, know it was there until the very end, I haven't actually listened to it yet. I read okay. it uh, just last night, and I haven't had a chance to listen yet. But looking over the playlist, there's a lot of new music on there I'm not familiar with, so I'm really excited to hear some new music. That's cool. Okay, so I wanted to mention I read Super Sons on your recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> and you know that, like, uh, online comic image that's like, I guess. <laughs> that's kind of how I felt about it. It was, uh, it was good. <laughs> It it was uh it was a lot of fun and I had you had very high expectation, I had very low expectation, <laughs> and we were both pleased. Yeah. So it was good. Well, I'm glad you were pleased with it. <laughs> I'm sorry it didn't blow your mind. I didn't blow my mind either, I guess. <laughs> I, just, I think I think it achieved what it had set out to do, you know, was to be an entertaining comic. Yeah. And everything like has its place and you know, you're not gonna get like a high-minded comic from everything, you right, know? Right. Well, and on that note, <laughs> we're going to now go to our segment interview with Kelly Thompson. And when we come back, we'll talk about some no spoiler thoughts on the movie Logan and give you our recommendations. So until then, enjoy this interview with the wonderful Kelly Thompson. How did you come about writing Hawkeye? Uh, it was actually one of the weirder getting to write something situations because Hawkeye was something I'd been pitching 
I mean, before it started, before it came out, it was almost two years that I started talking to Marvel about Hawkeye. And it was a year and a half, probably, that I'd been talking to them before it really started to happen. And it was like, okay. And there were like many versions of the pitch and many conversations with my uh, editor, Sana Amanat. Um, so it was a long time in that one. And that was just, I had what I thought was a really good idea for Kate Bishop to go back to LA and sort of be on her own as Hawkeye and running this investigation. Of course, since then, like Jessica Jones came back and mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Spider mm-hmm. Spider Woman became a PI. Yeah. And like, I'm, it's the new hotness. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I sort of didn't get there first because it took so long, but yeah, I mean, we were working on it long enough ago that when I pitched it, the idea for the book was to call it Hawkeye Investigations. Oh, and wow. um, But because Clint wasn't going to be in a Hawkeye book, um, you know, he was in uh, he's in Occupy Avengers by David Walker. And so the Hawkeye title was available. And so they gave it to us, which was super cool. That's awesome. Yeah. When we started this podcast almost a year ago, we were talking about how much we wanted Kate Bishop to have her own series and we wanted to see more of that. And when we found out that you were going to be doing one, we were all really excited. Oh, thank you. Yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think that um, a lot of people got familiar with Kate Bishop thanks to Matt Fraction's Hawkeye. And so, you know, um, I know there's Young Avengers, but I think a lot of people were probably introduced to her that way. So it was so exciting to see her get her own title. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're definitely, we try our best to be sort of the spiritual successor to the the Matt Fraction, um, David Aja, uh, Annie Wu, Matt Hollingsworth stuff. I think we try to do our own thing because we don't want to be derivative of what they were doing. Right, exactly. Um, I have a big, you know, occasionally you get people who don't like our book because they feel she was portrayed differently in Matt Fraction's book. And I mean, I'm sure I write her differently. And like I said, we're trying to do our own thing, but I feel like she's very accurate to the woo part of the storyline. Yeah. Definitely. And I feel like there's very much two Kates and I've never talked about this with Matt Fraction and, and the rest of his team. So I have no idea if this holds water, but to me, you get two very different Kates in that incredible book you get sort of Clint's perception of Kate Mm -hmm. which is far more together uh and then you have Kate's perception of herself which is in the woo LA storylines where she's a lot more scattered and a lot more like Clint than she or Clint would recognize um and uh she's still far more put together than Clint even on her worst day but uh so I think what we're doing is more like the the woo fraction stuff where you're getting more how Kate sees herself instead of how someone like Clint sees her. So that that's my take on that book a little bit. And so I thought about that a lot when deciding how we were going to approach Kate. Uh, so when you are creating an issue of Hawkeye, um, how much are you and... Uh, Leonardo Romero involved in each other's work do you play off of each other or is it kind of you handle the writing and he handles the artwork I think it's very separate um and I'm very fortunate that he's so very very good that we actually don't need a lot of back and forth um I mean I think there are there are creative pairings where that's awesome and where there's a more tight sync um between that creative pairing from go and there's more sort of shared responsibility and stuff but he's so good that he just kind of takes the script and runs with it and everything he does you know he stays pretty i write pretty tight at this point for him and he stays pretty close to the script but whenever he deviates it's for the better it's always an improvement it's always because he's sort of being a genius and like why didn't you think of this and I'm like you're right I should have thought of that you know so um not that he says that but you get my meaning so um yeah so it's pretty separate but largely because I feel like everyone is sort of playing their a game and just doing their own thing and and it's sort of coming together beautifully and then we have Jordy who's just killing it yeah yeah yeah, yeah we're we are big fans of Jordy Belair's work yeah she uh when we when we were first trying to nail down the aesthetic and we were just talking about the look of the book and everything she was asking me you know about and I was like well 
I was like, you sort of have the hardest job ever because what we're trying to do is like uh, an old Hollywood noir thing with the with the uh, detective stuff, but we want it really young and fun, and we're setting it in Venice Beach, which sort of has the noir thing, but not really. And she's like, so Miami Vice meets Hollywood noir. And I was like, yes! <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's what she's been doing, and yeah. she's killing it. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so you said before in an interview that Kelly Sue DeConnick is one of your recent big influences. How was it working with her on Captain Marvel and the Carol Corps? It was awesome. It was pretty daunting, I'll be honest. But um, it was, you know, Marvel really likes to do that where they bring in younger writers that they're trying to sort of groom and to see how you handle that stuff. They love to partner you with someone uh, who's big time like that. So it was sort of a great way to get to come in on a character I love. And with a writer that I hugely respect and admire, but it was sort of terrifying too. Like you get this feeling that they're like, Oh, look, we're going to help you by partnering you with Kelly Sue DeConk. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's great to just fall down on my face. In front of the <laughs> like that's, that's amazing. Thanks guys. So no, uh, Kelly was, Kelly Sue was amazing. Uh, I learned a lot um, about sort of how she approaches scripts and everything. It, it was really an incredible experience. Uh, were you a fan of Jim and the Holograms as a child, or was the story new to you when you started writing it? I was a fan. I think uh, I, I I wasn't one of those fans who saw it originally and then came back to it and like was like as an adult. Oh, I love it! It's amazing! I have the DVDs and everything. I was more. I watched as a kid. I loved it. And I think I wasn't even really aware what I was responding to about it as a child, which I think in retrospect is obviously that it was just wall to wall women and that it was not just an action show like G.I. Joe and all those other shows I was watching. But it was also a, about fashion and, and fame and these interpersonal relationships. And it was really different than sort of anything else that was on at the time, even though it sort of swam in that same pool. And uh, so, yeah, I was a big fan. Uh, when we were trying to pitch the book, I did a marathon rewatch of the whole thing. And uh, so so I try to bring as much from the show um, to, to the comic as I can. And I, I think we've done a pretty good job of merging those two. Definitely. Yeah, you definitely have. I mean, I was the I was born in 1980, so I was the perfect age for it. And I can still remember. Actually, I think my daughter has the Barbie doll still in the box and her earrings used to light up, but not anymore. But, <laughs> you know, you push the button, <laughs> they light awesome. up. So. I mean, as someone who watched it a lot growing up, it definitely, you translated it really well. Yeah, and Thank kept you. the whole, the spirit of the whole thing. Thank you. Sure, of course. Um, you've also published two novels. Um, do you, would you say that writing novels is um, more rewarding or difficult for you? Or is comics kind of the one that um, you get more satisfaction from or are they kind of equal? They're very different. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the rewards of doing a novel is that you're the only one who's gets to have any say in anything. I mean, your editor may be sure at some point, but you're completely in charge of that. And it, it lives or dies based on you alone. And there's something really rewarding and wonderful about that. At the same time, the greatest thing about comics is magical collaborations, yeah. uh, getting to work with people who bring so much more to the table, who make you think about something differently. Uh, but it's risky. Um, and that is the, the rough thing about comics. Uh, if you, for whatever reason, are not with the right partner, and that just happens in comics sometimes. It's not really avoidable. No, you know, no one's trying to make bad comics, but sometimes you're not a match and that just happens anyway. And, uh, it, it can be very frustrating to be putting your all into something and just sort of knowing as you're doing it, it's not going to work out because you're not in the right partnership. It, it's very frustrating. Mm. So I, I would say, ironically, the strengths are all tied up together. And if you get it right in comics, it makes everything better. And if you get it wrong, you're like, oh, Jesus, I wish I was writing a novel because then, <laughs> yeah. I, then I'd be in control of this. <laughs> It is very hard to switch gears. That's been the biggest challenge for me. I mean, my story killer book is way overdue and it's largely because comics has an incredibly punishing schedule where the second you finish a script, you're like, oh, great. I have exactly two days where I can get some work done, but you're so tired that you just like, maybe I should just go to the movies instead. And then 
you know, your next script is due. So yeah. yeah. Well, I know we've talked a lot before in the podcast about how stressful it must be to constantly be on and constantly be writing and thinking through these stories and, you know, some comic book fans having this expect expectation that every issue has to be, you know, a five star issue where every once in a while you're going to need to build some story things may lag a little or what have you and how much pressure that must be. Whereas when you're writing a novel, it's one continuous story that you stick through the whole thing. If that makes sense, you know, comics is totally. you're reading issue to issue. Totally. Yeah. And I think comics are maybe the hardest thing ever to review. Um, even worse for, for everyone, for the reviewers, for the creators, for the fans, yeah. Yeah. Uh, w even worse than TV because TV, you still get more time for each issue or each episode. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if you're talking half hour, a half hour of content is still more than 20 pages. Yeah. And so there's this incredibly rough thing in comics. And I think maybe I feel like we're seeing a lot more of it now, but it might just be because I'm a more on the creator side now, but you know, there's this there's this frustration that every issue has to be perfect and has to stand on its own and that's just not how narrative storytelling works like right. you ha you have to be able you know it drives me crazy when people even with hawkeye when they're like complaining about these little things like well why don't i know this why don't i know this? i'm like it's a freaking detective story are you kidding me like, <laughs> give me a minute dude i'll get there yeah yeah but i can't imagine how frustrating that must be <laughs> it, it can be very frustrating but you know not everything is for everyone and you just gotta let some of that stuff go at some point you yeah. can't control it you know yeah, yeah, I've become more aware of this problem since I started reviewing single issues over trades. I used to just collect the trades on my Goodreads and review them that way. But for the podcast to keep up and to, and to be able to remember what to talk about and what points I wanted to make, I started doing the single issues. And it's so hard to review just the yeah. single issue accurately and well when you don't know what's going to yeah. happen. It's like it's like reviewing yeah. 10 minutes from a TV show. <laughs> yeah. And you feel and then you feel bad as a reviewer if you keep sort of, you know, because I worked as a reviewer for a long time, you feel bad if you're passing the buck, too, because right. like you want to hold an issue to a certain standard, uh, and then you want to couch everything by going, but you know, this could really pay off. Yeah. And then you're like, yeah. wait, now, now I sound like I'm not even taking a position. It's a really tough thing. It's a really tough thing. And it's probably one of the reasons comic reviews are, are such sort of a rough place. You know, it's sort of a desert. You've got You've got some people that really commit to it and are really doing it and some sites that are really push it forward and do it and, and, and make it an impact there. Um, but most of those reviewers are paid very little, if at all. Yeah. And it's really a labor of love. And so you, I sometimes want to ring reviewers next, but I'm also very grateful that they're doing it out of such love for comics, you know? Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that the main point of reviewing something is to get it out there and let people know and so that they'll go and pick it up as well. But it, it seems like with comics especially, it's hard to actually give it a faithful review until the whole series or the whole run is done. And then you can review yep. it. <laughs> yeah, it's really tough. Would you want any of your novels to be adapted into graphic novels? Uh, yes, yes. I would like to do both The Girl Who Would Be King and Story Killer, I think would make great um, comic ongoing comics or standalone graphic novels. Um, I would love to do both of those things. I, it's just a matter of time and sort of bandwidth. And more importantly, I think than anything is artists, especially for the girl who would be King. Um, I would be open to a lot of different artists, but that's such a long work. I mean, that's sure. gotta be, that's gotta be a yeah. big pay. That's gotta be a big payday. That's something someone's drawing probably for a year of their life at least. So it's got to be – it would have to be set up with the right publisher so that that person is making a significant chunk of change. So, Do you have any, like, uh, dream collaborators or, like, dream illustrators for those novels? Um, I mean, I think, you know, Stephanie Hahn is so uh, – she's so key to the visuals for The Girl Who Would Be King – uh, it would be really hard to 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 say no to to her kind of being the dream collaborator. But I, you know, she does these fully painted, beautiful stuff. I don't really know that she's the right fit, or that she would even think she's the right fit sure. for a uh, for a three hundred page graphic novel of the girl who would be king. Um, I've always thought it might be nice to have Stephanie working with another artist and. 
you know, one thing that would be nice about The Girl Who Would Be King is you could very easily switch artists for the two character POVs. And as long as they weren't too jarring of differences in style, that might be a nice way to split the workload. I've thought about that a lot. Yeah. You know, so things like that. I mean, maybe, but Stephanie's style, Stephanie would be hard to split another artist with because there are very few artists with that mm. sort of painted, painted style and it would yeah. be quite quite jarring, I think. I always want Sophie Campbell to draw everything of mine, but by the way, she just has her own stuff she wants to do. I don't know what's wrong with her. <laughs> <laughs> she has her own ideas and thoughts and stories, but yeah. it's a real it's a real pain in the butt for me. <laughs> so out of all of the topics that there are that comics do cover, is there a certain topic or story or anything that you feel is underrepresented and kind of to go along with that, is there uh, anything that if you had the opportunity to write about that you would write about like a certain topic? Um, I mean, I always want to write about Batman. I don't know if that's a topic, but <laughs> sure. it's yeah. a thing. Um, I, I think we all want to write Batman if we're real. I think um, that's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I think I do write about a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in already. Powerful women, um, sort of uh, women getting their power back, you know, mm. women just being women in, existing in the world, whether as superheroes or something else. Um, I'm very interested in nature versus nurture. Um, a lot of things I write about, um, both creator own pitches I'm working on and also, you know, my novels is, um, has a lot to do with destiny. Not, I mean, I definitely, I definitely delve into and swim around in the tropes of chosen one stuff, but I'm more interested in the idea of subverting that, um, you know, if there's this destiny, why is it there? How can you fight it? I mean, the whole tagline of story killer is fight your fiction, which is all about, you know, yeah, sure. Tell me prophecy all day long. I don't, I don't give a crap. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And, and, but is, are you, is that even possible for characters who are sort of legendary, right? Uh, I, I can probably fight my destiny because nobody gives a crap, but you know, <laughs> can, can other larger characters who are doing bigger things, can they fight that? Should they? I'm very interested in stuff like that. I first found you through CBR, the article that you wrote, She Has No Head, which mm -hmm. I really loved. And ever since then, I've, I've followed you on Twitter and I've followed kind of your career. And I just really appreciated your viewpoint on comics. I just wanted to geek out for a moment. Since you brought it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you. It's, it's really hard to find. At least it's getting better, definitely. But it was really hard to find back then, especially that viewpoint in comics. And as a male that grew up reading comics, I almost had no problem with it until I started realizing and seeing from other perspectives. And I was like, oh, yeah, comics aren't OK most of the time, a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. No, I, I think that's very true. And, you know, I was by no means the only person out there talking about that stuff at the time. It was like, what, 2009, I think, that I started writing for CBR. And there were certainly other viewpoints out there. But I do feel like that's really a mainstream conversation now. If you're yeah. talking about comics, if you're being interviewed about comics, you know, it's it's just in there. And I feel like back when I was first talking about this, along with a handful of others, it was not something. So there's there's some real accomplishment there, I think, as far as moving the needle forward. I think we have a very long way to go. But I also think that it's it's always great to hear someone like you who's like, I didn't even realize this was a problem until I started reading about this and thinking about it. I mean, that's how everything is. Like, that's that's why books are so great, right? Yeah, that's yeah, why definitely. we ingest all this media is because it opens your mind and it makes you consider things you didn't consider before. I always like to give this example, this Batman. Let's bring it back to Batman. <laughs> uh, uh, one of my favorite story arcs of all time of Batman is Scott Snyder, Jock, uh, and uh, uh, Francesco Francavilla's Black Mirror book, yeah. mm -hmm. which is a w is a Dick Grayson Batman story. And if yeah. you had ever told me, I didn't want Dick Grayson to be Batman at all. I was adamantly against that. And then here it comes around and it's one of my favorite Batman stories of all time. And if I had like closed down and said no to that, what would I have missed? This yeah. one yeah. of his favorite stories of all time for Batman for me. Uh, are there any uh, other creators that you would like to work with? Do you have any like dream collaborations? I do. I'm, I'm dying to work with David Aja. Uh, I'm dying to work with Fiona Staples, which she's so famous now that will probably never happen. Uh, like, yeah. there's like there's like three writers on Earth that are going to be able to write with her, <laughs> maybe before you know she's done. 
Uh, and if I was Brian K. Vaughn, I would have her like in a cell somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you have to stay right here. She's too, she's too good. Um, I'd love to work with Annie Wu. I'd love to work with Becky Cloonan. Although, again, like Sophie, she you know she has all her own stories. So, a, a lot of the really talented artists that I would love to collaborate with. I mean, they really just are their own storytellers. So they don't need me. Um, Stuart Amonin is a favorite of mine. Uh, Tula Lote, I've been sort of secretly trying to get in there to work with her a bunch of times. Um, but I will spend my whole life trying to get back working with Ben Caldwell again. I feel like those three issues we did at A-Force are some of my favorite superhero comics yeah. ever. They were just so magical. I love them. I'll spend my whole life trying <laughs> to get back there. So Yeah. Um, often creators are asked, what advice would you give to someone wanting to break into comics? What advice do you think is important for people to know, but is rarely given or verbalized? Oof, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just because it's hard. I think yeah. all the advice that I would, I don't have anything insightful that's never been said. I have all the same boring, trite crap that everyone <laughs> says, like, don't give up. You know, I, I, I do think that, you know, I think that failure is is so seen the wrong way. Um, first of all, anyone that's sec successful has a ton of little failures piled up in their wake behind them. Uh, it's the only way to get to success is through having all those failures. Um, and not only are they key to getting there, but there's something to be learned from each of them. And, and the more you can learn from them, the faster you can get to the success thing. Um, but then even once you have success, there are still going to be more failures. I mean, all the stuff that you, you know, that you try that doesn't work, it just makes you better. But again, that's, there's nothing new about that. A million people yeah. have said that before and a million people will continue to say that because it's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate that like, uh, that failures aren't viewed as like badges of honor or like trophies on your way to success, you know? Exactly. Exactly. If we were smart, we would just have a wall of failures, like, you know, little moments in time, like, pinups so here are all my rejections yeah they, yeah. <laughs> they, they led to this thing because they're a lot more indicative of of what you're doing and what's working and what's not working than the trophies maybe yeah okay so here's another hard-hitting question <laughs> on your website the about me section states your ambitions are eclipsed only by your desire to exist entirely in pajamas so you yeah. have you have two options for this question one, if you were going to write about a character who only wore pajamas, what would that comic look like? And two, you were provided with a lifetime supply of pajamas with a character that you've written for on the pajamas. However, they're the only pajamas you're allowed to wear for the rest of your life. What <laughs> character do you choose? Um, well, I think because my use of pajamas is a little bit false, I really wear what my boyfriend and I call hobo clothes, <laughs> which are clothes that can't go outside and are a constantly shifting assemblage of like, like a, a slightly tattered dress with a sweater over it or like pants and a pajama top, like a baby doll pajama top and then a sweater or a, 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 a cardigan over it. It's like, you know, sometimes they have holes. It's, it's, it's a whole nightmare. Um, yeah, so hobo clothes. So since I don't really wear pajamas, actual pajamas that much, mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the first question okay. in which I would say, uh, Kimber Benton from Gem, Gem and the Holograms, who loves pajamas, and we made it a whole thing with her, and we gave her a bunch of pajamas, although pizzazz sometimes gives her a run for her money in the pajama category. <laughs> so maybe it could be starring uh, Kimber and pizzazz and, and just be them in pajamas. I, like I would it. read it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if Sophie drew it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So our podcast is, um, we try, really try to make it more about the community of comic readers just as much as it is about comics themselves. Um, so anytime we interview someone, we like to try getting recommendations. So besides Hawkeye, of course, or anything else you've written, um, are there any other comics that you think everyone should be reading right now? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think Saga is brilliant. It continues to be brilliant. It has from day one, which is really an incredible feat. Yeah. Um, I think that 
Tom Taylor on All New Wolverine is hilarious and brilliant, and I love it. Um, Kelly Sue DeConnick's Bitch Planet, I know it comes out sort of sporadically, but it's mm-hmm. absolutely brilliant every mm-hmm. time it comes out. Um, I I know that nobody, that, and this is part of the problem with comics and reviewing comics, but Lazarus by Greg Rucka. Yeah. You know, it's like nobody talks about that book because it's in its 20s. It's been consistently one of the best books ever for two years plus. It's amazing. Um, so what else? Um, I'm really behind on my Marvel reading, but I love um, Unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Yeah. I love I love a lot of really funny books, which you maybe can guess from the things I write, <laughs> the things I like. But um the uh, Great Lakes Avengers, I find. Yeah, amazing. that has we been so fun. <laughs> yeah, very funny book. Um, I love the new Jessica Jones book. Mm-hmm. Um, I, what else? I The Scarlet Witch book I'm really behind on, but I find it very interesting how they've done it with a different artist each time. I think that's brought something really interesting to comics with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Greg Rucka's Wonder Woman. I just caught up on that. I'm only one issue behind now, and I think it's really brilliant. And I'm not a fan of the double shipping for any book, for any book anywhere. I'm not a fan of that. But uh, they found a way to really make it work. Uh, that's very impressive to me, and it's sort of really nice because I haven't been able to read Wonder Woman for a long time, and so that's it's been pretty fun to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. It's always nice for someone to breathe new life into a character. Or um, returning life. I mean, yeah. I feel like, <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like it's, uh, you know, what he's doing now feels very different from what he did. God, I don't know how many years ago it was what, that his run on Wonder Woman was. It feels very different than that. Mm-hmm. But it also feels very much how Greg Rucka feels about Wonder Woman, you know, and his approach to her has always been very consistent about her voice and who she is. And uh, it's an amazing voice. I love it. Awesome. Well, I think that was all the questions we had. I had one last question, though, that I didn't think to put on. And it might be a silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> um, since you're the current writer for Kate Bishop, if they were going to do like they're doing with so many other Marvel characters, and make a show or incorporator into a movie. Do you have a fan casting? This is, I'm asking on a personal Mm. level, I think, because I'm (laughs) dying to know who you would cast. (laughs) Um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I do like to think about casting, but Mm -hmm. I tend to only think of casting for my own stuff just because I know there's two. I know a lot of people um, would like to see Kate Bishop. Um, Usually I, I usually see as a, as a woman of color, but usually Mm -hmm. Asian sort of non-specific Asian is what I see people saying, um, which could be interesting. I mean, certainly I, I love to see diversity uh, and I don't think Kate Bishop is a character that has to be white for any reason. Right. I mean, exactly. There are certain characters here and there that do feel that way for whatever reason, but I don't see it for Kate. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I've seen before the, the girl, ironically, I've seen both women from, Teen Wolf mentioned before. Um, I, f- I forget their names. Uh, Arden is maybe one of them. And then there was a girl who played an archer, but she's maybe a little old to play a, a young Kate now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the answer is really I don't have anyone specific, but I, I sometimes see rumblings and they always seem pretty good. Yeah. Um, what people are saying. Yeah. Awesome. I think our uh, collective fan casting has always been Aubrey Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I just, mean, but that's a totally different kind of Hawkeye and one I could completely be behind. Yeah. <laughs> that, she would, yeah. That, that could be really fun. Yeah, but it could I be just, fun. That's a very specific thing. But that said, that could really work with sort of the Hawkeye investigations. Right. Angle, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, with sort of less actual superhero stuff. Right. Um, that could actually work a lot. I just, as much as I've I've been flattered to see a lot of people saying that uh, our book would make a great yeah. TV show, and it would, it would make an amazing one. I just can't imagine they would let us be out there, some version of us be out there when Jessica Jones is the only other female show out there and she's a PI. So yeah, I don't, that's very well, true. I don't hold, I don't hold out a lot of hope that it's going to happen, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you have anything that you want to plug? Let's see everything. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 
I uh, so yeah, Hawkeye is coming up. We've got Michael Walsh uh, is doing guest art for two issues for our Jessica Jones arc that starts with issue five. Issue four comes out in a couple weeks, I think. So issue five will be out, I guess, in late March or early April. And uh, Michael's doing a great job on it. Um, that's still Jordy is still coloring, so that's great. And um, let's see, Mega Princess has got its. Issue four just came out this past week. The last issue will be out next month. Um, and we've got some very exciting news coming for Gem and the Holograms and the Misfits. Uh, I think that's going to be next month. Maybe even at uh, Emerald City Comic Con they're making the announcement. I'm not sure. Awesome. Yeah. So, And then I've got a couple really cool things that are coming, but nothing I can tell you about. Sure. <laughs> uh, that's when, always the case. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> where, where can people uh, find you online? Uh, the best place to find me is usually Twitter, which is at 79 semifinalist. And then uh, I've got a Tumblr, which is 1979 semifinalist. And the website is the same, 1979 semifinalist.com. Well, Kelly, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and um, answering our questions for us. Thanks so much for having me on. I had a great time. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Guys, Logan. Screw you, Logan. I can't believe he faked his own death. <laughs> no, I'm just there's a story behind that that yeah. nobody cares about. <laughs> yeah. um, he didn't do that. that no, that's related no, no. to or something else. Or did he? Else. No spoilers. <laughs> Is this a no spoiler uh, discussion? All right. We won't do any spoilers. <laughs> we can have like a spoiler uh, bonus segment. If we there, want you there you go. There you go. I need a hug. Yeah. And some food, like was, comfort food. <laughs> it was a heavy, it was a heavy, um, it was movie. heavy. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I think that, I think that just from watching the trailer though, people will know. Right. What it's to more expect. or less what they're yeah. in for. Here's the thing though, is watching the trailer, I was led to believe that it was going to be violent and it was going to be sad. It ended up being about twice as sad as I thought it was going to be. And Three to ten times as violent. <laughs> yeah. It was really violent, guys. So don't be like the people sitting in the row with us who brought their small child to the movie. Yeah. Don't do Not it. Not a movie for toddlers. Mm -mm. That Please toddler don't. was vocally interacting with that movie, and I'm worried about what he's going to grow up to be. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, good, the, the good side is that Corey and I, our 10-year-old our son, was like, will you let me know if I can watch it when you get back? And the answer is no. Yeah, the good news is it was an easy question to answer. The bad yeah. news is no. <laughs> no, not for another like 10 to 15 years. <laughs> when you're 25. Which he still hasn't seen Deadpool and is really sad about. So. Yeah. But you can't... A, a twenty year old, a thirty year old can't even. But watch guys, Deadpool. I would, I would maybe <laughs> let my kid watch Deadpool before I let them watch Logan. Really? I, well, I don't know. They were both pretty brutal. Uh, yeah. But Deadpool it's like okay, but here's the thing, guys. Innuendo. Deadpool was more stylized violence. That's true. Logan was legit. Yeah, like, like they're not they're not cartoonally no. joking around with the violence. No, so but I mean, it's no, and I don't want that to deter people from watching it though. Um. It was beautifully done. Yeah, yes. Oh man, absolutely. So, so wonderful. And I was reading the trivia on IMDb and read that the director is going to be releasing a black and white yeah. edition, just mm. like they did for Mad Max. That's cool. But I mean, I kind of have mixed feelings about that, guys, because I feel like I didn't watch the Mad Max one because for me, most of the beauty of Mad Max was in the coloring yeah. Yeah. and and everything. And I feel like Logan, it was a little bit the same way, mm. you know, they did such a good job of making Logan look sick and like whoever did the makeup in this movie was yeah. incredible. So I, I, I just got to say that any excuse to watch it again. So right, I'll watch the color exactly. one, I'll watch the black and white one. Right. Hopefully they'll have like 12 different commentaries yeah. and a million bonus features and an extended cut. And yep, I'm hoping for all of it. Give me like a 20 disc Blu-ray <laughs> set. I'm buying it. Um, <laughs> life savings. Goodbye. Yeah. Like I have life savings. What a joke. <laughs> um, yeah. Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart is always 
incredible. But oh my gosh, Daphne King, the kid who played Laura. Yeah. You guys. Man. She's going Typing places. Skills. <laughs> skills. She is going places. So um yeah, and I also have a strong desire to go home and hug my kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Me too. I don't even have a kid. <laughs> yeah. Um Corey, I feel like we're monopolizing everything. But do you have something to add about how awesome? It was. Uh, I just, I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, I've, over the last, I guess it's probably been about a year and a half that um, All New Wolverine came out. Mm -hmm. And I've really enjoyed that. And so I was most excited to see Laura Kenny in a movie. And, you know, there's, there are some similarities to Old Man Logan. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's definitely not a retelling of Old Man Logan. No. But, um, you know, so I appreciated that there was kind of a wink and a nod to that, but it told its own story, and I think it told it very well. Um, something that has nothing to do with really the movie, but I thought was interesting was that for the UK release, it came out at the showing was at 1023 because the Roman numeral for 10 was yeah. X. <laughs> So that was X twenty three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I liked it. I felt like um, the last two Wolverine movies were not awesome, and this one was really redeemed itself. Absolutely, but it's because it wasn't a Wolverine movie, you right? Know? I mean, like it's a movie with Wolverine in it. Yeah, I mean, it did what we love about a lot of our favorite comics you know are about like superheroes vision. but the human side yeah like the right it's it's good storytelling is what it is and it's not a story that has anything to do with saving a world from some big threat or saving a city you know it's it's about relationships and all that goes with it i think yeah yeah and just as a pro tip for you there's no mid credits after credits just before the credits scene but there is a bit of an opening scene for the whole film, and it's fun. I like yeah. it. So get there on time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, don't don't worry about sitting in your seat waiting till the very end, though. No Dillian, no Dallian. <laughs> but as soon as the movie's over, you can get up and go. You can, well, yeah. Well, after the fun Johnny Cash song's over. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> no one's Wait ever described the Johnny Cash song as fun, <laughs> except maybe Ring of Fire. I don't know. <laughs> I remember that uh, one year someone bought me a Johnny Cash christmas album for christmas and every song was about someone dying yeah <laughs> well especially i mean they use um you know they used a johnny cash song in one of the trailers and then the one at the end which are both from his american recordings which are i mean some of the saddest but yeah. like some of the most moving yeah, super but powerful. so yeah so um they definitely set the tone without a doubt so recommendation time okay i'm gonna recommend in lieu of Logan, that uh, read Old Man Logan by Mark Miller, if you haven't read it yet, and then read this uh, new run on of All New Wolverine. Um, I think it's, we're at like issue 18 now, or 19 maybe? 17. 17, okay. Um, and it's fantastic. It's, it's really fantastic, and... Um, I don't know, like, I wouldn't say that the movie is a primer for the comics or the comics are a primer for the movie because they're really their own creature in their own yeah. way. But if you like seeing Laura Kinney in the movie, you'll definitely love seeing her in the comic. Yeah. And then, like, I think in issue 18 or maybe 19, we were, talk we were texting about this the other day. The cover is uh, Laura Kinney in The Weapon X get up mm, yeah yeah so it'll be interesting to see what they do there i really want to go back and reread those old comics that were her with her origin uh i remember picking them up uh single issues when they were first coming out and i loved them and uh i would i really need to revisit them scout what do you recommend Oh, I don't know if I read enough this last week to have a recommendation, <laughs> honestly. Um, if you're not reading this new run of Hulk with Mariko Tamaki, definitely pick them up. Um, you know, right now we're only on issue three, and I know a lot of people may be hesitant, hesitant to read issue by issue. Um, 
But, I mean, I think that this is one that you can read that way and get a lot of payoff with each issue. Mm. So, definitely something to check out. Vinton? Royal City, number All one. All right. Pick we'll do it. it up, please. Yeah. We, I feel like Corey and I should mention, like, we would have read Royal City. We would have read Hawkeye. We would have read all these. But um, the shipment of comics to our favorite comic book store was delayed yesterday. And we were going right. to go today. And then our truck broke yep. down. I had wah, to wah, wah. do a Vitten rescue mission was, for, for Logan to happen. a rescue yeah. mission <laughs> for Logan to happen. Thank you, Vitten. Yeah. But we, we paid it. him with popcorn. So that's right. Yeah. It was some good popcorn, too. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the fancy theater, got the big seats yes. that we climbed. I kept hitting it, it, the button with my elbow and making it move <laughs> during the movie. Logan is two hours and 17 minutes, guys. So do it in style and do it in comfort. <laughs> yep. Wear comfy pants. Yeah. <laughs> Sweatpants if you got them. Yeah. No one cares. No. You think people are going to care and judge you. No one cares, and everyone no. wishes they were in sweatpants, the, too. The movie is so good that everyone's- <laughs> Lots of envy. Their yeah. eyes are going to be on the screen and not on your pants. Exactly. Well, they should, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this what is a family we show. Going to? <laughs> and on that note, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for listening again, and we'll actually see you again next week, back on our regular schedule of going every other week from then on. Remember, you can check us out on Instagram, at ReadBraveComics, on Twitter, at read underscore brave. You can check out our website where I actually transcribed our interview with Liz Prince. So if you want a readable version of that, check out readbrave.com. Good job, Vin. Yeah, that was a lot was, of work. It was nice a lot work. of work. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> or graphocast.com, G-R-A-P-H-O-C-A-S-T.com for more podcasts. Also remember that all of our shows are brought to you by our wonderful patrons on patreon.com. If you'd like to be a supporter, kick us a dollar a month or more and get some extra goodies for doing so, check out patreon.com slash graphocast. On Twitter, I'm at Flesh Eater. I'm at Scoutcasto. And Corey's dead to Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is dead I don't to Corey. Exist. <laughs> He's off the grid, man. <laughs> I, I'm at Ron Swanson and never going to get on the computer <laughs> although again. he did mention something i tweeted the other day so he's still checking every I'm once in a you. while <laughs> <laughs> that's not ominous at all <laughs> until next week i'm vinton bain i'm cory casto i'm scout casto i always try to think of something clever to say there but i always fail <laughs> <laughs> and okay. i'm still crying after logan <laughs> yes. goodbye everybody <laughs> This has been a Graphomania production. If you would like to hear more podcasts, go to graphocast.com, G-R-A-P-H-O-C-A-S-T dot com. Follow us on Twitter at Graphocast and like the Graphomania page on Facebook for news and updates.